Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Watchman Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli military, security, and intelligence practitioners and experts. And our guest uh, today is Brigadier General in the Reserves, or retired, we'll talk about it, Dr. Amnon Sofrin. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. Both a senior military intelligence officer and then a very senior Mossad official, as well as the writer of a very interesting PhD thesis on decision-making in the uh, political military realm, uh, a comparative study of uh, various uh, systems, Israel, Great Britain, the United States. We'll talk about that as well. So is it uh, retired or the reserves? Is, is it uh, uh, possible that uh, in Israel anyone ever retires? Not totally. Sometimes you retire, but uh, you, you, still, you are still interested in what's happening around. You're reading, you know, you notice, you analyze it automatically without noticing if even. But uh, nevertheless, you are always updated somehow. Not to the pinpoint, but you know the general picture. You know how to analyze things. Let me give you an example. Somebody asked me before the Russian invasion to Ukraine, what will happen? What, how will the West react? And they say they react forcefully. They will fight until the last Ukrainian. So that will probably bring us uh, to your uh, Mossad days and, and your uh, contacts with other uh, governments and services. But um, does the younger generation consult with you veterans, you uh, who may not be, as you say, up to date on, on every last detail, but uh, who have uh, a wealth of experience? On some occasions, not, 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 not very often. General Suffering, you started out as an infantryman. You, you didn't uh, plan a military intelligence career, did you? Never. How, how uh, did it come about? Uh, what was your experience in the 1973 war and later? I joined the armed forces on uh, November 1972. And I chose to serve at the Golani Brigade. Which why was, why Br Golani? Uh, at that time, the paratroopers uh, were considered more prestigious. Yeah, but I chose because of that fact. Not to be what considered to be more precious or more you know, well known, to be a hard worker. So you were um, a classmate of Gabi Ashkenazi, among others. Uh, no, no, Gabi Ashkenazi came directly from... Uh, military the, the, preparations. Right, so so while, while he joined in, in late 72, as you were, he went um, on a separate... Uh, no, during track. the 73 war, he was a cadet in the officer's course. Yes, because... Well, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. because he went directly. Okay, so, so what was your track? I was on an NCO course. It was called Battalion 17, which was part of uh, Golani Brigade. Dubidro was the, was the commander. Commander, of course, the battalion commander. And on Saturday noon, it was October 6, we were due to uh, leave for a vacation for the weekend. And on Friday morning, after uh, being prepared to leave, get out, I said, okay, please stop, go back to your barracks, because uh, there, is some there are some tensions around on so our borders. So what, what we should explain here is that the Golani Brigade was a regular infantry right. formation, and um, as distinct from the reserves, which were not called up before the war started, but the uh, regulars were on alert and waited orders. On high alert, right. So, okay. You Waiting. have another, another, another weekend to spend in the barracks and we are prepared to, uh, you know, to go to battle if needed immediately. Did many of you fast? This was Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. You of fast? Course. No, no, I didn't fast. Yeah, or, well, most of us fast. At this day, but uh, on, uh, Saturday, on Saturday noon, I had a very important mission. I was keeping the gate, of guarding the gate of the barracks 
And suddenly somebody comes out from our barracks and calls me, leave the gate and come back quickly. And I say, what happened? And he said, the war broke out. That's how we knew that the Yom Kippur war broke out. No sirens, no planes no, in the air? No, 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 no. It was in the area of Jenin, so uh, you couldn't feel anything in the air. At, at that time, the Palestinians were, were quiet, quiet, totally quiet, passive. quiet, totally quiet. So about two hours later, we left the barracks and began to move to the Golan Heights by buses. And we arrived to the area of uh, Masadeh, what we call Masadeh Forest. Not far from the Hermon Mountain. Right. And we were organized there. And uh, on the third day of the war, we began climbing on Hermon Mountain. This was the first attempt. Because the outpost there was captured by the Syrians. On the first day of the war, on October 6th, four helicopters landed on the Hermon Mountain with commando units, and they captured the Mount Hermon the fortification that we had on Mount Hermon. And they were asked to release it. We had no idea what was the size of the enemy, its deployment, its weapon systems, nothing at all. An intelligence failure. Totally, totally. And we began climbing. We had uh, two efforts. One was going by foot. It was a battalion called the 51 Battalion, headed by uh, Yud Kepelet. And the second one was our battalion moving along the road with APCs, the old APCs from 1945, the Americans. Half-tracks. Half-tracks, right? And a platoon of tank leading us. And suddenly the road was blocked by mines. And they tried to evacuate the mines and to uh, clear the road. And the be snipers began to uh, shoot at us. This is where the battalion commander was killed. Yeah. No, no, least. a little bit later on. But uh, what happened that uh, the, whole, the whole convoy stopped on the road. It was, a, you know, it's a very road, narrow road. And steep. It's steep, and people are sitting below you and sniping into your uh, APCs very precisely. And you see it very tight because there is no much place, so people are sitting with the feet like that. And suddenly I noticed that two of my colleagues are dead. They were shot on the back by snipers. Sitting next to you or across the aisle from you? No, no, across the aisle. I was sitting up because I had what they call a machine gun, a heavy machine gun. So I was sitting up and I looked down and I saw some. Suddenly I understand that two of them are killed. And I called my uh, CEO, uh, my commander of this unit and I said, we have to get out immediately because we're going to be killed, each one of us. Sitting ducks. Sitting ducks. And we began to climb, and uh, we suffered a lot of casualties. And Amir Grory, the brigade commander at that time, gave the order to uh, leave the place and get out because uh, we, can't, we don't have enough power to recapture the Mount Hermon. So you retreated was, after suffering heavy casualties, right. um, along with the feeling of... Frustration, disappointment. frustration, disappointment. You know, that you come out with the feeling that uh, this is another story of uh, 1967. The heroes are coming, shooting some shots, and that's it. And everybody lives. And, and, suddenly, in, and in addition to, to the general frustration of the Israeli Defense Forces, the Golani Brigade lost it or didn't uh, succeed in recapturing it. So it must be the one to recapture it a couple of, of weeks later. Of course. Of course, it can't be otherwise. So? So we had other battles as well. And on the last day of the war, we were uh, returned to the crime scene to recapture the Mount Hermon. Now we climbed by foot. We began moving from uh, Masa de Forest at about 5 p.m. And we began climbing up. Heavy road. load. On the road, of course, on the road that is called today Golani Road. I can tell you that uh, for myself, I carried out a weight of about 40 kilos on my back and my shoulders. And you probably weighed only a 60 kilo or something. It was <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost your 70, entire... 75 about, about. 
and uh, we climbed up. It was uh, a very, very tough and frustrating. And uh, when we got up, what to a uh, place that they call uh, the tank curve, we began climbing up on the hill that is called was called Sixteen Hill. And as we got up, we got bullets flying all over. People were killed, and everybody went down, and they said, okay. Again, an ambush which you didn't know about. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And then they sent five of us with machine guns, with heavy machine guns, to go aside and to begin shooting at the enemy to enable us to go around. To outflank. Mm-hmm. And immediately after five minutes, I was left alone because uh, four of my colleagues were killed by snipers. And I was left alone and I had about, uh, I believe it was eternity, but in the end, it came out to be something about an hour, fighting against three positions of Syrians, each one of them containing two people, armed with snipers gun. And it was dark already? Yeah. Yeah, it was dark. It was about 2 p.m., something like that. 2, 2 a.m., sorry. Something like that. And uh, I found myself fighting for my life for about an hour. And in the end, killing them all and joining my uh, mates. Everybody was sure that I was dead as well. And suddenly I came out from the immortal. And we managed to recapture the mountain. We lost about 50 people and about 85 people wounded. A heavy price. But at the same time, the reserve paratroop brigade came by helicopters uh, from another angle. To, get, to, recap, to capture the, what we call the Syrian Mount Hermon. And uh, that was about the end of it. And about it, it's about, I think, 10 a.m. we left back and we began getting down. So the Golani Brigade reclaimed its honor, but um, it took a very heavy price. Correct, correct. What Look, was your lesson? Uh, I had two lessons. First of all, we didn't have any intelligence. Not at all. Not even the slightest one. Even at the battlefield, try to find out what the enemy is. How, it, how, how he is deployed? What kind of ammunition does he have? What kind of weapon systems? Nothing at, nothing at all. So in the end, that was the best lesson that I've learned, that uh, you need intelligence in order to save lives. Tactical intelligence. Tactical intelligence. And people must be prepared for such a fighting. Not to go you know, without knowing anything about the enemy. And I kept on serving, and I became an NCO, and later on I went to an uh, officer's course to be a cadet, and I came back to be a platoon leader at the same unit that I uh, was an NCO in. And I was a platoon leader for about uh, 10 and a half months, and I became deputy to the company commander. And then we had an action in Lebanon in uh, Kafar Kila, which is very close to Matula. Right on the northernmost border of Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, what we call the later on... Good the, Fence. The Good Fence was established right there. And uh, we went to uh, look for uh, people that are assisting the terrorists. We had to go over five houses. I was with Gabi Ophir, who was a deputy to the battalion commander. Later a major general. Later a major general and a very liven man, and a brave man. And both of us were standing along, or leaning on a wall of the outside fence of the house, and letting the people get in and begin operating in the house. And suddenly across the alley, an open, a window was opened, and somebody began shooting at us. First of all, some of the bullets hit the wall, and we were hit by ricochets. And one bullet hit my leg. And while falling down, I automatically shot to this direction and killed him. Not because I was a great sniper, but I had a good luck. Good reflexes. Good reflexes. 
and people were injured, and one of them was badly injured, a soldier of mine, that up to uh, about a month, uh, <coughs> a month and a half ago. He was badly injured, and uh, we, in the end, we had to uh, land an helicopter to evacuate the people that were wounded. There was no room for me, because I said, first of all, the soldiers, and if you have a place, I'll go up. And I went all the so way. So troops first, officers later. Always. Only, only Always. on a space available Always. basis. And in the end, I went all the way back to Metula with a wounded leg, leaning on somebody. You walked? I walked, somehow. And I arrived to Metula, and then I was sent to a hospital, and uh, coming back after about two months, and brigade and, made, and colonel at that time, Binyamini, was a brigade commander. He said, uh, I'm pleased to see you back. I want you to be a deputy uh, company commander for about three more months, and then you'll be a company commander. But so, that same guy, Binyamini, later went on himself to be the chief intelligence uh, corps officer. Before that, he was the head of tasking division or tasking department within the military intelligence. And then he began. He so became so that, that ties in with your intelligence ah, career? Somehow. Somehow. And I said, uh, Colonel, it's uh, very nice, but uh, I can't. I can't function anymore as I did before. And I don't see any position where the company is uh, moving ahead. And the company commander is on the back and calling them, wait for me, wait for me. It won't work. He said, okay, what do you want to do? Because in the Israeli infantry, the slogan is, follow me, of course, uh, not wait of for course, me. Or of course, never. You have to keep up with the uh, right. young guys. Right. <laughs> and then he asked, what do we like to do? I said, uh, I still have 10 months to serve. If you find me something very interesting, I would like to stay here in Golani Brigade and keep on. He said, what is your opinion becoming an intelligence officer? I said, it sounds nice. So I went on an uh, intelligence officer's course for about a month and a half, and I came back and I was the intelligence officer of uh, the 13th Battalion. As a lieutenant? As a lieutenant. The same battalion that I grew up in, as an NCO and then as officer. And I had two battalion commanders. The first one was uh, Itzik Zamir, and the second one, Ilan Biran. Later a major general. Later a major general, and my commander at the Central Command, later on, and uh, about 10 months afterwards, I decided I was hesitating whether to leave the armed forces or not, and I uh, tended to stay because of the situation, because of the wounds coming out of 1973 war. And, and we are need. speaking about, about the mid to late 1970s. No, it was 1976, no, 76, right, 76. And then somebody called me for an interview and said, uh, would you like to carry on? I said, depends on what you're suggesting, what you're proposing. To become a career officer. Yeah. Up to that time, it was your conscription duty, right. plus the time you had to, to uh, serve after officer's uh, school. Which is one year, Addition, one additional year, on top of the three years that uh, you serve as regular service. <clears throat> and I said, depends on uh, what you propose. And he said, uh, would you like to be a second or deputy to the intelligence officer of Colony Brigade? I said, no, I've been there. I want to learn something else. And he said, I'm not sure I can propose it. I said, okay, no deal. And then he called me back after two weeks and said, uh, would you like to go and be an air photo interpreter? I said, yes, that sounds good. And I went to the unit, the central unit in uh, in the military intelligence, which was in Tel Aviv. Now it's called 9900. Yeah, yeah. It began as otherwise, but uh, now it's called, it's part of 9900. <laughs> and I've been there for about two years, dealing with the Lebanese territory. A very unique experience for an intelligence officer. Us usually collection, um, and especially um, Air Force and uh, interpretation is different, separate. Uh, than the other uh, disciplines. Right. 
But I wanted to learn something, you know, deeper than being a field officer in, by itself. I had this experience, and I knew I, go, I was going to be back to this position as well. So I went there, and I've been there for uh, two or two and a half years. And I said, okay, I have enough. Now I, I can move on. This is only what the Israeli Air Force aircraft um, managed to bring? No right, right. satellites at the time? No, no satellites at the time. Satellites became only available on 1997, something like that. But the Israelis did get from the Americans some uh, satellite photos. But not here, only in the U.S., Okay. So in the end, I, uh, after two and a half years, I went on and I said, okay, I can move on. And they proposed to me to be the intelligence officer of uh, aerial brigade on the Lebanese border, which is called 769. Territorial brigade. Aerial brigade, yeah, territorial, aerial, the same. I said, okay, I'm willing to go there. And I've been there for uh, more than two years and said, okay, what are we going to do next? Now we have to go to the division level. So I went for a reserve division to be what we call the regular intelligence officer as a captain. It was a division led by uh, General Kahalani at that time, and later on he was replaced by uh, David Katz. So I've been there for two more years. Again in the Northern in Front. The nor in the Northern Front, always in the Northern Front. And then I say, okay, I'm willing to go on. Now I want to go to the production division of, uh, of the military intelligence. Go back to the factory to see how it's being done. Yeah. Not only to be a consumer. No, 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 no. To produce your, your own intelligence for all the people that need it. Again, a very unique uh, career track. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I planned it carefully by myself. Not somebody, not that somebody proposed to me to go there. I insisted that that's what I want to do. So I went to the production division to the Northern Front one more time, dealing with Syria. And I've been there until 1984 including the 1982 war, dealing with the Syrian armed forces and the engagement between them and IDF, of course, on the Beka Valley and in the area of Beirut. And then I went to the Staff and Command College for a year. As a major. But, as a major. But when you graduate, usually you get a senior major's position or a lieutenant colonel. Oh, no, yeah, I, I, a senior major. Still not a lieutenant colonel, and then they caught me and say, okay, now you have to go to be an instructor in the military intelligence school because you've never been there. You avoided coming here, now you have no, no choice. You have to pay your dues. So for uh, six, years, six months I've been there for, uh, instructor, as an instructor and I uh, instructed what we call uh, advanced military intelligence officers at the brigade level. Two courses, one for reservists and the second one for regular so the officers. And after that, I was promoted to go to uh, Tselim. The, the uh, ground forces uh, ground training, forces uh, training uh, area, training, training center, actually. And in addition to be the, the, the intelligence officer of an armored division, a reserve armored division, 220. I've been there for uh, a year and a half. And then I was appointed to be the intelligence officer of the division, of the regular division, the arm of the regular division, of course, 162, in the Jordan Valley. And that was a very peculiar timing because the first intifada broke out on December 1987. And after a short while, we were called to be to get control over the area of Samaria, meaning from Jenin in the north. At that, at that time, there were uh, brigade headquarters in the West Bank, but no only division. Only one, no, only one headquarter, only one brigade controlled the whole area. And there was no uh, divisional uh, headquarters? No. So no. Your, your division 
uh, got almost by chance this uh, duty. Right. To be, to be in control of uh, the area of Samaria, meaning from uh, Ramallah and to the north, meaning Janin, Tulkaran, Kalkilia, and uh, Nablus. And uh, for about, I think it was five or six months, we're, okay, we were dealing with that. And in addition, all the regular issues that you have in the armor division, meaning trainings, plannings, and so on, nothing stopped. So I divided my team into two groups. One group was staying at the barracks in, uh, in the Jordan Valley. And the second one was with me in uh, Nablus. But at that time, because there was already peace with Egypt, your contingency planning had Syria as uh, the uh, projected enemy for your division. We had actually three plannings. The first one was Syria, the second one was Lebanon, and the third one was Iraq. in the Jordan Valley. No, in the Jordan Valley. In the Jordan Valley as a uh, defense. Right, as part of what we call the Central Command Plans. Uh, standing division, the armor division that the Central Command had. had <clears throat> and that was some other things we, we used to do uh, during this time. And so, after uh, about five months, we got back to business as usual, and I carried on. So General Suffering, uh, we'll stop here. And uh, when we uh, meet again for the second part of our conversation, we'll talk about the uh, 1990s and on, and your positions with military intelligence and Mossad. So for the time being, thank you, and we will be back for another edition of Watchmen Talk very soon.